Are they? They are no more. To the victor go the spoils and the most lying lines of history. Cause it was always beautiful, unlike the terrible now. But I say, if then was as they say it was, how could now go so astray? So if then was now and now was then, I say both times twice. Left at least a few, somebody's been back over besides. Been back far enough and fit to break. I say back then there was a rending, a mining, a ruining. Just like now, just like this time. Maybe now sitting in front of the screen and behind the screen all at the same time. Creates a friction, a fiction, a feeling of multiples designed to make you wretch, fetch, catch up, leery eyed, numb, suck, soul sucked, unmirror time. You think you can spin the world around, soar up in the sky, you could be flying, flying, flying around the whole round world. Maybe you can take my hand, I will go with you, I will go with you, I will go with you, I will fly, I will dive head over heels into the pool that is empty, you and me. We will have no feet, we will fly round and round, our bodies shape the air like clay in our hands. I say, can we make this time that time now? We must make it now, the time to put aside the lying we've been doing, we've been doing. It is time to put aside the lying, the lying we've been doing, we've been doing. We got to remember, we got to say what we can about the truth. Together we will, together we will, together we will, we will remember all that time, and we will say it was not fine, now, now, we will make it so, now. If I stay asleep, if I count some sheep, if I sink in too deep, won't I miss the sunlight break? Who will hold me now as I swing in this bower? Isn't it a late hour? I don't have no cares to shake, but I, 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 I. Thank you, Okwi. Um, my, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Four Freedoms Town Hall at Sundance. Uh, my name is Eric Gottesman. I'm a visual artist and a filmmaker and one of the co-founders of Four Freedoms, along with my friend uh, Hank Willis Thomas, also a visual artist. Um, and we started Four Freedoms three years ago with kind of a simple idea. We wanted to merge political discourse and artistic discourse. Uh, we believe that all art is political and that public policy uh, is the product of the culture that art helps make. Um, we, you know, we, we believe that citizenship is not about status or ideology, but about uh, participation. We're all citizens of Sundance here today because we're per participating in this conversation. Uh, and art is a really critical form of participation, especially for voices um, 
that have been pushed to the margins by systems of power. Uh, I just want to give a, a brief overview of, um, of what Four Freedoms has done over the past few years. Um, we started as visual artists kind of masquerading as political operatives. So in, in 2016, we started a, uh, a super PAC, the first artist-run super PAC. Uh, I bought a suit and uh, dressed up <laughs> like a political operative. And, um, and we started doing things. We started doing things that artists do, holding exhibitions and doing public art installations. Uh, that grew over time. I'll skip over a number of things, although there's a number of people in the room tonight that have watched us grow and have been with us from the beginning. Um, and, uh, and, and the exciting thing, the, the recent exciting thing that we did was in 2018, we did something called the 50 State Initiative, which um, was the largest uh, creative collaboration in American history. Uh, we worked with 250 uh, institutions, museums, galleries, colleges, universities, um, arts organizations like Sundance uh, to do billboards like this one by Susan Micellis, who you'll hear from in a moment, uh, as well as uh, 150 other artists around the country. We also did uh, town hall meetings like this one here today. Uh, at, at, we did about 150 of those. Um, and each one of them sort of took their own format and their own life and connected to issues that, ha that, that were relevant in that lo local you know, uh, ecosystem, cultural ecosystem. Um, we reached millions of people, I can say. I know the billboards alone hit about 70 million people. We also had ex exhibitions um, at uh, colleges, institutions, all decentralized. The idea was that all these uh, artists are already doing civic work. We are already civic leaders. The work we do, if we can connect it to um, the stories that, um, that we are trying to tell, this is the kind of political engagement and civic work that I think our politicians should aspire to. And yet, oftentimes, artists, even though we are the storytellers, uh, we cede that storytelling capacity to our politicians. And Four Freedoms is based on the idea of building a creative infrastructure around the United States that already exists, but connecting it in such a way where we can uh, have impact. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot more to say about Four Freedoms, but I, I want to I wanna just um, briefly mention that in 2020, we're going to be building upon that infrastructure. Uh, there's several of us here today. Tanya Silveratnam has been an incredible uh, key advisor for us. Kamal Sinclair at New Frontiers at Sundance has been amazing. Uh, Taylor Brock and Miriam Fogelson are, are here. Please talk to one of us if there's anybody that would be interested in participating in uh, what we're going to do in the future because we're really um, excited to keep building this idea. And a special thank you to Sundance and to Tabitha Jackson for uh, making this possible. So I'm going to hand it over to it's you. It's a complete Tabitha. pleasure. Um, <clears throat> we are so delighted that we can have this conversation. And forgive me if you literally just said this, but can you tell us why it's called Four Freedoms? Oh, yeah, sorry. Four Freedoms, F-O-R Freedoms, was the, uh, it's a play on the F-O-U-R Freedoms that FDR uh, spoke in 1941 in the State of the Union Address. Freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of speech, and freedom of worship. Um, Norman Rockwell painted those four freedoms uh, two years later in 1943, and they became, kind of, they became kind of iconic images of what it means to be American. But, of course, what it meant to be American in 1943 was not necessarily re reflective of what it actually meant to be American and who was involved. And so we noticed that a lot of the uh, images, um, you know, uh, that Rock those images that Rockwell made that became icons of Americanness um, was all white people. I mean, there was one African-American woman in the top left corner. There was a Catholic that was kind of hiding uh, in the freedom, from, freedom of worship picture. So we, we, we remade those images last year to make it a little bit more reflective of, um, of what it meant to be American. Uh, and those images were part of our campaign, were on billboards and eventually on the cover of Time magazine. And one of the things that um, Taylor, who, Taylor, would you just wave? who's standing in front of that whiteboard. One of the things that Taylor is doing is helping us to construct what we're calling a digital quilt so that you can go and just have your portrait taken, it takes five seconds, and you just write down what your freedom is, freedom to or freedom from, dot, 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 or freedom of. 
um, and your faces and your aspirations around freedom will be uh, stitched together in a digital quilt that we can then um, disseminate. So we'd love it if, if people do that. So thank you so much, Eric. I would say that it's um, the thinking that Sundance Institute has been doing uh, around how we um, work with people to disseminate the values that we believe in around freedom and independence and freedom of creative expression and open societies. Um, this is a great kickoff and this conversation I'm really looking forward to. So I wanted to, my mic sounds very echoey. Am I all right? It's okay, okay. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick framing of what we're going to be doing for the next, I guess, 80 minutes, which reminds me, I have no idea what the time is. And this conversation should, could go on and should go on for days, but we have to be out of here by 3.30. So I'm gonna need a timer, maybe uh, Johnny or someone in my eye line to come up and, and uh, uh, keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, we want to talk about this provocation, can art save democracy, which is quite presumptuous, some people might think. Um, and there are I have a couple of desires. One is that we talk not just about America, but about the world, because we are an international film festival. Art is global. Artists are from all over the place dealing with different things. So um, let's make sure we don't get stuck in this particular rut. Um, and the other thing is that Sundance is a wonderful coming together of art, artists, and ideas. From the outside, it might look very cozy that we, who are all so lucky to be here, on this beautiful mountain um, can sit around and talk about what brilliant things we're doing. But actually, I want this to be a more difficult conversation and um, understanding what the responsibility of artists are and also what the power of art is. The power of story isn't just a good thing. One might argue that in authoritarian hands, the power of story is an incredibly powerful tool because they can have the simplest story to embrace difference and complexity and diversity reduces that story, reduces the power of that story in some eyes. So let's really understand the difficulties and complexities of this conversation. Um, we're gonna start by hearing some uh, responses to this provocation um, in no more than five minutes, delightful beloved artists. I'm gonna bring up four people You've already heard from Oakwe, and I think we understand where she sits in this question. Um, <laughs> the, these, uh, these artists um, come from different disciplines, think in different ways, are free to express whatever they want to express in response to this provocation. We're going to hear from them first to get our juices running. And then we're opening up. This isn't, this isn't a panel, it's a town hall. So I'm coming among you with a microphone to hear what what your responses are. I'm gonna be slightly rude in that if you can keep them pithy, it means we can hear from more people because we don't have that much time. And then we're gonna come back and try to synthesize what we've heard. And then importantly, try and go away with some takeaways um, so that we can talk, we can go from the ecstatic to the pragmatic and leave on time. That's my job <laughs> as facilitator, all right. So let's start, and I would like to, it's a, it's a, I feel bad because um, we're going to start with the legendary photographer, Susan Mizellas, um, the president of the Magnum Foundation. Susan has just been to see a film called Always in Season, an incredibly powerful documentary that has um, had her in pieces. So who knows what she will be able to deliver after seeing that film, which I recommend you all go and see. But would you welcome to the stage, Susan Mizellas. So can I first thank Okwi? Because you carried me from that film into this room. But it's still hard. Um, so I was thinking as you were walking, how I move and where I move my body, where I take my body, and maybe I'm supposed to click. Um, and it's the wrong. It's the image before somehow. Never happened. Hit the red button. Hit the red button, sorry. So where you move your body, where you place yourself as a witness, to record, maybe to reflect, hopefully to remember, 
And of course, time is at play, which is why that film was so incredibly powerful. For those of you who haven't seen it, you must. Um, this is a young man on the border of the US-Mexico border, um, 1990. One thing about photography is that it can be framed and reframed and decontextualized, which is why I was so happy to be part of Four Freedoms. This is in Denver. Um, and yet, of course, I'm only hoping that that image can trigger the associations that many of you have been reading in headlines, the thousands of kids who've been separated from their families. I think when I also make images, I'm thinking about the multiple lives they can have. So part of it is living in a different context when it's not in a magazine, when it's in a museum, when it's not on a page, it's not fixed. You move with the work. This is work weaving the life of that young man back to Central America where I had worked the decade before. The color images from Nicaraguan, the insurrection, black and white photographs from El Salvador during the Civil War. Because everyone crossing that border has this history, some history that they bring to that crossing, the disruption of their lives. What do we understand of them? So it's how to bring a recontextualizing to a photograph. And then thinking back on 30 years ago making this photograph, again, part of that series uh, on the US-Mexico border, that was our fence. That was really our fence, our wall. That's all we needed. We could see each other through it. Um, so when I made this image, just about a month ago, and of course all of you know our nation's been paralyzed over this concept of a wall, what kind of a wall, what material of a wall, should we see each other, should it be solid concrete? And looking at that young man, and I very often think that when I'm making photographs, I'm making a photograph of the present, but thinking in the future, we'll understand it as the past. I never would have imagined when I made that image before that we would be today having the kind of war, be it war, for the hearts and minds of Americans' souls. So what I would guess say is something about the photograph is uh, time-specific and timeless and gives us so much to think about over time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm going to actually just come down to you for a second because I want to ask you, can you make a more direct connection between art and democracy, the role of the image maker in democracy? Well, the thing is you can't be sure of how it works. So I want to say you have to work from the doubt and the sense of the passion. You have to just do it. We all experienced you walking through this room. We're all going to feel it differently and a photograph looks like it's a fixed object. How does it relate to the democratic issue in this country at this moment? Are we going to be a diverse nation as we have been with the values we share? How can I give you that back through the stories that I can tell, through the images, the voices, the diversity? That's saving our democracy from my view just to be connected to that feeling of the loss if we lose this diversity, if we lose the opportunity to, in fact, engage. And yes, we should all go and, and it's feel that connection, if we can. It helps a lot. I've got you down as a yes. Oh. All right. Oh, you really want a yes? <laughs> no, I don't, no, I don't. Thank you so much. So... Just have to do it. <laughs> From photography thinking about time and memory. I now want to move to artist and co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullis. Would you come up and tell us your... Thank you. Uh, super grateful to be here. Um, how we doing, Sundance community? <laughs> this is my first Sundance ever. Never did I think I would be here in these white mountains <laughs> holding space in this way. Um, art is a vision. Uh, art 
is a vision for many things. Uh, it's a vision that could be a vision for terror and trauma. Uh, art can be a vision for resilience and brilliance. Uh, and we're living in a moment where um, we are, we are at war. We're at war around our vision. And which vision is gonna take us 150 years from now? Part of the work of the artist is to create new worlds, new perspectives, new ideas. And those ideas are not always gonna be ideas that we agree with, that we believe in, but the artist is the curator. And in 2016, I think we all remember where we were at, because I can just say that year, and you know what I'm talking about. I was envisioning something different for this country. But in 2016, the vision was shifted. And every single one of us in this room, everybody across the country, and I argue everybody across the world, had to imagine a different place for America. And so the work that I believe that we've been doing inside of Black Lives Matter has been calling for a new imagination. This country has been so obsessed with black death, so obsessed with black pain and trauma that we can't even imagine black people living. So the work of the black artists in particular, I argue, is the work of dreaming bigger, of setting a tone and a path about what is possible for black life. What does it look like for black people to exist in sci-fi movies? What does it look like for us to exist in fantasy worlds? And what kind of dreams and visions we're having that for me is the foundation of democracy. I argue that black people have never lived in a democracy. And so our work is to actually create that world where when black people have democracy, every single one of us will have access to it as well. Thank you. And uh, it's worth me just pointing out that one of the reasons Patrice is here is because um, she is the, uh, a participant uh, in a film called Bedlam, which is an extraordinary documentary, and I urge you all to see it. So thank you for both sharing that, for the work that you've done in building this movement, and then also for agreeing to put your life, part of your life, on the screen. So that's your commitment to the art redoubled. Thank you so much, Patrice. So now to the theatre, which could be seen as the birthplace of democracy, the home of democracy. Um, and I can't wait to introduce you to those who don't already know her, to the extraordinary playwright, actor, artist, Lisa Crone. Thank you. I'm going to need to look at these notes. So it, it, I, you can use that if you want. The, you can use it, you can the use podium? It. Yeah, if you want. I will stand at the podium. <laughs> All right. Um, because I work in the theater and I need a set. Um, well, uh, I, I'm first uh, uh, going to be very, um, uh, Tabitha asked for a provocation, so I'm first going to uh, be very negative on this question, and then I'm going to come around. I just say that so you won't be in an argument with me the whole time. <laughs> Um, uh, can art save democracy? Absolutely not. It didn't work for the Greeks, uh, who invented Western drama specifically for this, pers for this purpose. Uh, the um, Dionysian festivals were required uh, for every citizen to attend day-long marathons of plays that were written 
out of the founding myths of Athens to grapple with what it means to be a citizen. And people would all come, audiences of 15,000 people, they would watch play after play, eat and discuss them in between. There would be speeches and state funerals and all kinds of things on either side. Um, Athenian democracy lasted less than 100 years. As it began to erode, horrified playwrights wrote better and more urgent plays, plays that still have meaning for us today. Um, a couple of times, people did claw back their democracy, but only briefly. The tyrants won, and then it was over. The Hellenistic period, however, lasted much longer. The art persisted even after democracy was gone. And I think it's very important um, not to be deceived about the power of art to save democracy, because just as uh, art can lift and transform and can move us, it can also be an excuse. It can make us feel that we're doing something that we're not really doing. It can make us feel connection and compassion and demand nothing of it. You can tell the most compelling story about income equality and that will not change the power structure because as a rule, and there are some exceptions, people will support and even advocate for change up to the point where their own status is on the line. Yes. So, um, so uh, yes, when we talk about change, generally, we're picturing the ways in which we want other people to change. Uh, generally speaking, we do not buy tickets to the dislodging of our own self-justifications. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so to make those things happen, we need a more forceful uh, push. The best tool available to us for, the, uh, for tending to the actual machinery of democracy is not art, to tend to the regulatory systems, the border policing, the policy structures, environmental health care, housing, criminal justice policies, voting rights, all of the systems that shape our lives, we require the deep labor intensive work of political coalition building, effective protest, unrelenting activism, investigative journalism. Um, that's what we need. Our democracy is on life support right now, and just like if I was on life support, I would want a doctor by my bedside. I would not want an artist there describing my condition. <laughs> now, to be clear, I am not saying that art is not political. All art, certainly all narrative art, is political because whether they realize it or not, artists are placing their characters somewhere in the existing economic, political, and social hierarchies as they understand them. And any artist who says that politics don't belong in art is actually saying that he believes the status quo is not worth acknowledging, acknowledging because it is immutable, and that point of view is political. Okay, so, but. <laughs> art has the potential to transform because it is made of transformation. Making art is, transformal, is, is transformational because when we make art, we realize our power to redefine the world. And that might make us political people. Uh, the, there's a, there's a, a moment that happens to any uh, artist uh, from a marginalized community that can happen when they realize that there's no golden circle of excellence that they're waiting to get in. When they realize that golden circle doesn't exist, when they stop hoping somebody will invite them in, and what they ask for then is a share of their resources, but they stop asking to be let into something that doesn't exist. They stop saying, I'm waiting for you to look at me because you're looking at me does not make me real. I am real and I see you. And this is the reason that artists are often thrown into jail in repressive regimes. Because artists claim their own authority. No one gives it to them. They claim their own authority. An artist tells not her own story. I really don't like this construction because I think it's reductive. An artist tells the story of the world from the place where she stands. And if that story is not in alignment with the status quo, it can be a revelation and it can be a dangerous thing. There are, as Patrice uh, touched on, two competing myths about our country. And this is also something that art gives us. It gives us our myths. And myths 
They're not truth, they're not history, they are self-definition. And the two competing myths of what it is to be an American, one of them is that America is the land of the rugged individualist, where all a man needs is grit and hard work and he can make his own destiny. This, of course, is absurd, abhorrent, and delusional. <laughs> the second myth is that we are the company of open arms, equality, and fairness. This is also a delusional myth. But that is not to say that it is meaningless. These two myths are in open combat with each other. And for many people who had the luxury or the delusion of thinking that one of those myths, really either one of those myths was true, the era of Trump is interrupting their enchanted sleep. And for, for some of those people, they now are faced with a choice. They start to see the distance between that myth and the reality. Without that myth, there's nowhere to go. This is potentially, and we don't know, I don't know what, which side is gonna prevail. I don't, I don't think any of us know what's gonna happen. But if something, I mean, it, Patrice described it so beautifully, the, the thing we've never had that could be possible. If that is to happen, it is the myths which are made by artists. It is this beautiful myth of America and the striving to get closer to it than we've ever been, which is what will take us there. Thank you. All right. She is great. So, in perfect timing, Almost theatrical, Ava DuVernay. You enter the room just as I'm about to call you to stage. So we've heard from photographers, we've heard from performers, we've heard from artist activists, we've heard from theater makers. Now, Ava DuVernay, will you represent all filmmakers? <laughs> and indeed yourself. And take a second and come and respond to this provocation, can art save democracy? Ava DuVernay. I thought I was just gonna sit and rest and relax for a little bit. Nah. -uh. No? We've got to sort this shit out quickly. Can art save democracy? <laughs> well, happy to be here. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, happy to be here. And uh, this doesn't fit here. Okay. Um, I'm just here to read something that is um, become like a mantra and a motto for me in so many ways. It's really informed my mission as a filmmaker, um, also as a film distributor. I have a film distribution collective called Array, not subtly. <laughs> Is it on my hat? Um, where we distribute women's films by women and people of color. We've distributed uh, 21 films in the last nine years by hand through a community uh, coalition of people who just love films and want to make sure that they can live and breathe outside of the studio ecosystem. And so when I'm starting to make a film, uh, whether I'm in the writing stage or the uh, the directorial phase or the post phase, uh, whenever I'm going into a new phase of my own filmmaking or whenever I'm about to embark on a film that I'm, I'm going to distribute, I always read this to myself and so I thought I'd share it with you. Um, some words by Toni Morrison and it um, comes from an archive that was found. She had visited a university in Portland in 1975 and about four years ago these papers were released, a, tr a little trove of, of papers and, and, and um, um, tapes from her visit there and uh, one day I went through and I found this little piece and um, it's kind of stuck to me and become a part of my DNA so I'll share it with you now. Uh, she says, free and dedicated artists reveal a singularly important thing that racism was and is not only a public mark of ignorance it was and is a monumental fraud. Racism was never the issue. Profit and money always was. The threat was always jobs, land, or money. When you really want to take away to oppress, to prevent, you have to have a reason for despising your victim. Racism was and always is a con game that sucks all of the strength of the victim. It's the red flag that's danced before the head of a bull. Its purpose is only to distract to keep the bull's mind away from her or his power, her or his energy, keep it focused on anything but its own business and its own progress. 
Nobody really thought that black people were inferior, that they only hoped we would behave that way. They only hoped that black people would hear it all and weep and resign. They never thought that black people were lazy, ever. Not only because we did all the work, but they certainly hoped we would never try to fulfill our ambitions. And they never thought we were inhuman, for you don't give your children over to the care of people you believe to be inhuman, for your children are all the immortality you can express. Racists were never afraid of sexual power or switchblade. They were only interested in the acquisition of wealth and the status quo of the poor, including the white poor. It's important to know who the real enemy is and to know the very serious function of racism, and I'll add sexism and homophobia. Its function is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you, from, it keeps you explaining over and over your reason for being it may very well be left to the artists to grapple with this fact. For art focuses on the single grain of rice, the tree-shaped scar, the names of people enslaved and shipped, not only the numbers. And it's the artist, the artist, and it's to the artist that I say not to be confused. Don't waste your energy fighting the fever you must only fight the disease. And the disease is not racism, it's greed and the struggle for power. She says, I urge you to be careful for there is a deadly prison, a prison that is erected when one spends one's life fighting phantoms, concentrating on myths and explaining over and over to the conqueror your language, your lifestyle, your history, your habits. To avoid the prison of reacting to racism is a problem of the very first order, where the mind dwells on changing the minds of racists is a very dank place, where the spirit hangs limp, where the will that you allow to be eroded day by day by consistent assaults of racists, that will just settles into a tiny heap of sand. Racial ignorance is a prison from which there is no escape because there are no doors. There are only old men and women running institutions and organizations all over the world who need to believe in it and need to have the victims of racism believe in it too, to concentrate all their creative abilities on it. They thrive on the failures of those unlike them. They are the ones who measure their wealth by the desperation of the poor. They're in prisons of their own construction. Their ignorance and stunted emotional growth consistently boggles the mind, but the artist knows that we are human. And if you look at the world as one long, brutal game between us and them, then you bump into another mystery. And that's the mystery of the tree-shaped scar. There seems to be such a thing as grace, such a thing as beauty, such a thing as harmony, of which, sorry, it gives me emotion, of which are wholly free and available to us. Life is short, freedom is in my mind. That's where one is free. There's always some other constriction, but the very important point is to do the work that one respects and to do it well, and to make no compromises on its authenticity, and then to do it better the next time. The artist's role is to bear witness, to contribute to the record and the real record of life as he or she knows it. Perceptions are all one's own, for all art is political. Toni Morrison, Portland, 1975. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, okay, we've heard some amazing responses and, and provocations, and um, I think we should open it up to you now um, uh, to respond either to the provocation on the screen, Cannot Save Democracy, or to what you've heard. Um, I'm gonna come among you with a microphone and, uh, what's your name? Jan. Jan, and so, well Jan, and so raise your hands. I'm gonna start though, I'm gonna start here because I can see in the audience is um, a fantastic director called Petra Costa. She has a film in the festival called The Edge of Democracy. Uh, about the political situation in Brazil. So, um, Petra, would you just like to respond to anything you've heard or how you think about, you're in the middle of a democratic crisis. What, what's going on in your mind at the moment? 
very moved, particularly by Liza and Ava. Stand up. I was thinking when you asked, can art save democracy, that I think the main challenge that I've seen in art the past few years, when I look at American art in particular, in the art of cinema, is how class has been put aside and how few films show class acting in the dramas. And when we ignore class, I think we create the beginning of the erosion of democracy. And it, for, it's very important to, as artists, to embrace class again, and race, and gender, but not forget class um, and the warfare that is going on. And as Warren Buffett said, they are winning. <laughs> the rich are winning. And uh, in Brazil in particular, I think a huge um, duty of artists is memory. We had a very long military dictatorship that was very, very rapidly forgotten. And um, it's, I was telling uh, Tabitha, there, there are no films almost about the military dictatorship. And I hope Brazilian artists can look back and remember it because it's coming back in very scary ways. So thank you. Thanks, Petra. Okay, other, other thoughts? How should we respond to any of this? Yes, uh, did, you have a, did you have a thought? I mean, I'm afraid of, of saying this, um, but I think it's been echoed very clearly from everyone who's spoken so far. And I, don't, and I, I wanna also pay respect to all of my elders who are here uh, before I speak. Um, but I'm afraid that we still believe in democracy itself. People have talked of myths of democracy. I believe that democracy has always been a tool that was made vulnerable with, 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 with weaknesses that were intentionally to be exploited. I don't know if the democracy that we wish to save is the democracy that we want to keep. Uh, I think it's important that we work as artists to establish the future, uh, but that we remember that there are several intentional layers that go back thousands of years that leave us vulnerable to manipulation and to believing things that are not true about race, about class, about gender. And I'm afraid that in our celebration of our knowledge of these things, that we lose sight of the mission. I think in order to save whatever the true definition of democracy is, we must recognize that we are all artists. And if we all recognize that we are all artists, then perhaps we can create something new. And I think that there is a promise somewhere uh, that we can develop uh, and have the imagination to both recognize the fallacy of our current democracy and just build a new one. And that is what science fiction is about. That is what uh, vision is about. Uh, and that's what I'm about. Uh, uh, but I'm afraid that we will be stuck celebrating what it is that we believe that we know. Uh, and so uh, I guess the last thing that I want to say is um, uh, I, I guess let's find the future. And I don't want anyone to think that my questioning of democracy is a tacit uh, approval of any other social systems around the globe either. Um, none of this shit works. Um, so um, that's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to find others who can work here. And I think artists recognize this most uh, readily. And I, and I appreciate all the artists that are here. Uh, and I look forward to what it is that we can create together. That's wonderful, thank you. Can I, do you mind sharing your name? I just couldn't read your name. Uh, Ifanya Bell, I'm from, I'm from Portland, which is scary. <laughs> Ifanya, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm a filmmaker. I'm, I'm, wor I'm working with a lot of really talented, creative black people in Portland trying to make the future. Oh, okay, you spotted a bit of Ebo in there, did you? Nice. Yes. Sir. Winston Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government except for every other one. When, when I look at that slogan, can art save democracy? Art can empower democracy. Art can be used badly, as we learned in the 30s, and can be powerful 
in terms of dealing with the most important capital, which is human capital. How do we inspire people? How do we get people of all colors and races the opportunity to express who they are? How do we get past being, quote, liberal elites, so that somebody in West Virginia doesn't want to go in the mine, but wants to be the next filmmaker? There is a reality that said, from the dark ages came the Renaissance. We're in the dark ages. The ability is to use art to lift us. And I believe art can empower democracy. Thank you so much. Yes. So if you take... Okay. All right. I'll go to this lady and then if you, you do these two. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Pat Caesar, and, and I'm not a seasoned filmmaker. Um, I, I made a film to get the kids to vote in the midterms because I, um, I cried the night of the 2016 elections and they make fun of me on Fox News. It's, it's just a three minute rap video and, and I bought a lot of ads on Facebook. I cut it up because that's what I could, that's what I could do um, to talk to kids. It's a rap video um, called Crying After They Rap. But, but it's, it's good, stuff. I think it helped. We got a lot of, we got Menendez reelected in Jersey. I gave out Skittles at colleges. I give out Kleenex, I have Kleenex for all of you um, to give out. But, but if I had the money, and, and there's a lot of probably better artists in here than I, because I'm a comedian and an actor, I'm, and I, I used to be an art director in advertising, and I made this on my SLR in my backyard, and my music guys from here. But, um, but if I had the money, you gotta talk to the other side, and there's a lot more, better, more brilliant minds in here than mine. The numbers don't lie, but they do. It's all, as, as two people, brilliant people said, it's about the money. And they use racism, sexism, any type of system, homophobia, and abortion to get people to vote against their own interests financially. You have to talk to the other side, and you have to tell them the numbers don't lie. And you've got to make a film that reveals that without yelling at people that, are from, that have been watching Fox News for years. They've been making fun of me for Fox News for two years, and I'm nobody. So how do you break that cycle? How do you change those minds? You gotta pull down the curtain, and I don't. I mean, if I had the money, I would. I would. I spent four hours on my plane ride talking to a Mormon, explaining to him that the, about the numbers and about how the tax plan is going to hurt him in the end. But, but, um, you know, we spend two percent. Two percent of the world is, uh, the Americans are on on um, food stamps, but it only costs fifty-five cents a year for each of us. But the tax plan is the two wars cost us seventeen thousand dollars each. And he said, I never thought about it that way. And I said. And you know everybody needs health care, but they voted against health care. So more brilliant minds in here than me. So somebody make a film. Numbers don't lie. <laughs> oh, that's a, but yeah, and you can check out crying. And I'm going to recut my film for the general election. So if you see crying, if you lady rap, send it to all the 18 to 25 year olds to get them to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's great. You're going to be uh, rapping for us later. Yes. All right, thanks for having this. Um, my name is Fanny Veliz. Hey, Eva. I have a company called Avenida Productions, and it's my partner. And what we do mostly is empower the Latino community in the US. Um, thanks. Um, whatever means necessary, and we're just trying to humanize our community. We are American, like everybody else, and so we're making films about DACA and you know, inspirational films. And I'm from Venezuela, so talk about democracy. <laughs> um, and I'm really battling with the fact that we have no democracy and no freedom. And we're, I made a movie that's on HBO a couple years ago about the students because the government just won't let us speak and keep censoring us and finally the international community has spoken and trying to give us a voice but it's coming from this man that's like just like the one who destroyed us right so i have people that i admire telling me like oh you don't want us involved i'm like you know what i have to ship food to my country to my family so they can eat so all i can do is really make movies and try to give a voice to my family and to my friends and to my countrymen. So I have seen the power of film because I get calls from Venezuela and people thanking me for making this movie. So I urge you to please 
everybody in this room, be a voice, use social media, create pieces that are gonna empower the next generation and just really value democracy. And I wanted to answer what you said. I, I get that democracy is not perfect, but when you've completely lost it, you appreciate it. The fact that I can stand here and talk to you, I couldn't do this in Venezuela. They took my identity, I don't even exist. I can't even go back to my own land. So yes, I understand we're not perfect, but at least we have a little bit of freedom and that we can make a change. Thank you so much for, for listening. So I know what we're talking about is can art save democracy, but as a lot of people from different places um, from around the world are here, why isn't the question can art save the world? I think democracy is, we kind of talked about language and, and how language is imperfect. And I think that's the really big issue here is when we say democracy, we're thinking of this idealistic or something that we haven't really reached yet. And, um, and I think that art is something that transcends words. It's really touching an emotion or a feeling or evoking um, those emotions or feelings from humans. And in a way that sometimes a single word can't encapsulate. And really how it can transcend words and transcend emotions. And what I'm hearing from everyone today is that we all have very similar issues, no matter where you're from, no matter if you're in a democracy or not. And we have the fact that we think of ourselves as countries and as silos when all of us face these same problems. There is racism or there is, you know, think about global warming and all these other atrocities hunger in all these areas and educational crises. So how can art save the world as a whole, not just us in America or other people who are in countries that have democracies? Because I really do think we think of ourselves in these silos a little bit too much when we have a lot more to relate to other countries that aren't democracies, and we still face very similar problems, even if their title of their government isn't democracy. So just kind of posing that question a little bit. Thank you so much. Raise the stakes. Jane M. Sachs. <laughs> I'm Jane M. Sachs. Um, I'm the president and artistic director of Project AND. It's an arts organization that collaborates with artists to create new models of cultural participation. I'm also a trustee of the Nathan Cummings Foundation, a social justice foundation. And I just wanted to offer a couple of things that guide our work, and one is, I think that democracy promises one thing and one thing only, and that is equitable participation, nothing else. And art has a unique ability to deliver on that. And so that's actually where art comes in, in, in the role of, of democracy. The other thing that I think a lot about in terms of my work is what is the relationship between art and justice? And the relationship is human dignity. There is no justice without human dignity. There is no equitable participation without human dignity. And there is no art, really art, that speaks for and to and with and among without human dignity. And the other thing, just thinking about some of what Lisa was saying and something that also I think a lot about is I don't think of art as the first respondent. When you need blood and sandbag and water, you don't call in art. But it's the second. It is second to blood and water and sandbags because it reminds us of our humanity and taking risks. It reminds us of failure and who we actually can be and who we can aspire to be. And we all can be second respondents, right? And that's what we have in common. We're not all the same, thank God, you know? But the idea that we can be second respondents, which is when you have the time to reflect, right? It's what the quote that you read so beautifully is about, is when you have time to say, okay, it's not about a tourniquet, right? But 
what do we do after that? What's the reason to survive? What's the reason to thrive? Great. So I think we have over there the director, Dream Hampton. Hi, thank you. Um, hey, everybody. Hey, Patrice and Ava. <laughs> hey, y'all. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what comes. I know that we think about art from the left, but I've been thinking about for years now, like how we build, narr how the right builds narratives. I know you just advised that whole thing. <laughs> this is so weird. We've got a sound bleed in here. <laughs> is there a video playing right now or something? Oh, yeah. Have you guys seen the movie? Is that no. no. Who's back? No. What? 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 Or not? Have you it's a okay. conspiracy. <laughs> we will, uh, so, yeah, do carry on. Yes, please. okay, yeah. for sure. So, I, I mean, I think about, for instance, how we have over the... the <laughs> oh, all right, let's try and uh, sort this. Let's try and sort okay. the sound first. It's often like, it's the one area we should never neglect, right, are the sound folks. Um, <laughs> that happened with my first film that came to Sundance in 03. The sound was just lost. Um, anyway, um, I've been thinking a lot about basically how we have come to believe in, like, say, a simple lie, like that every day when police wake up, they put their lives on the line. And we um, began to believe that lie, despite the data, like people have been talking about numbers, you know, numbers don't move people. <laughs> the data is that 0.0001% of policemen are killed on the job. I think we had about 87 people killed in 2017 out of however many millions of police we have. And the way that we got that narrative was post-Vietnam, post-Nixon, when the public generally distrusted authority, Hollywood began to produce, and TV shows, instead of the, defend, I mean, the, the uh, defense attorney, we began to have shows about the prosecutor. We began to develop police drama after police drama, so that now when you like, turn on any TV, if you have cable, or your grandmother does <laughs> still, or your mom does, that like 70% of the programming either centers around the police or is specifically about police. And then I think about the ways that black folks can't even get something made, or people of color, without being having an agent of the state adjacent to our, like to kind of basically say that we're human. And I mean that whether you're Miles in Spider-Man, like your dad has to be a police officer, or Wakanda has to be saved by a CIA agent, you know? You can almost count the number of narratives that don't have police in them. You could be Dexter, you could be a serial killer, but your sister works at Miami Dade, right? So all of these things like have created this moment where we arrive, where Black Lives Matter emerges, where we are disbelieved video after video about this re very real oppression that I think is not just about profit. You know, to disagree with Tony, there's a lot of sadism in racism that makes it something different than just capitalism. But I offer that as like, I hear you about art coming second, but there is this preemptive way that stories are set and we begin to accept them. And, and they just set the debate. And I think that's something we need to be thinking about on all sides. Thank you so much. Um, we, have, uh, we have a question here that I'm gonna take now. And also I want to call out the fact that the questioner is a volunteer. So she is working at the festival for no money in the freezing cold. And so, yes, your question. Do you want to stand up? Um, um, hello, my name is Karen Gaitan. I um, feel a lot of ice on me right now. <laughs> so um, I come from a city in Texas on the U.S.-Mexico border, Laredo, Texas, 
where we are the largest inland port. We make over $173, $173 billion in process trade, but a third of our population lives under the poverty line. There's a lot of undocumented immigrants, and there's, it's, for the most part, I would say it's a sleepy border town where people are dissatisfied enough to complain, but complacent enough to not do anything about it. So can art save democracy? Absolutely, because art has the opportunity, but it can only save democracy when everybody has access to it, not when we keep it in these concentrated circles where we can be here and talk about all of these great things, but there's all of these rural communities and smaller communities that will never be able to engage in this conversation. So art saves democracy when it's paired with activism, with education, with authenticity and on the ground work in communities that need to hear this. So in Laredo, for example, we have seen over the past 10 years a transformation in the community where there has been, there has been artists and they do poetry slams and screenings and concerts. And you see a shift where people who used to feel ashamed of where they come from embrace their heritage and embrace a new, a new vision for who we can be. So Laredo, for example, art can allow us to imagine a new reality where we see ourselves as leaders and we don't see ourselves trying to fit into the status quo. We can create it. And art has the opportunity to show that to us. Thank you. So, right. <clears throat> okay. So we're running out of time which actually makes me quite happy because it means all this pent up articulation and thoughtfulness about democracy, you're obviously gonna take onto the streets and talk to other people and continue the conversation. I'm gonna back, come back to Tanya and Eric. We have, we have what? Patton, oh, Patton, I'm sorry, I so rudely walked right past you. <laughs> My eagerness to get back on stage, Patton. Hi, um, I'm Patton. I'm the head of the visual arts team at Kickstarter. Um, I'm also a curator, and up until recently, I also owned a community gallery in New York. Um, and I think coming from my perspective of somebody who really tries to raise the voices of artists, um, I think my responsibility in this, play, in this space is slightly different. Um, I think what I've seen a lot of amongst specifically, I would say, my community of fellow curators and gallerists in New York is a lot of saying that we're doing the thing by putting on the exhibition and by giving the space. But I recently very, very vehemently believe and have um, written an opinion piece on it that we need to hold each other more accountable. Um, we actually, just showing the work isn't the job. The job goes beyond that. And we are, as you mentioned, a very small insular community and we're located in these small spaces but if we are able to band together and put our voices out more broadly and loudly, then we're able to affect more change. So community building is one thing, but holding each other accountable for the work that we're all doing and making sure that we are making progress together and are aligned in the ideas and missions that we want is incredibly important. Um, and I know Four Freedoms does that, so <laughs> I'm a big fan. Thank you so much, Pat. That's actually, um, that's the perfect segue back to how we can tie everything we've heard from our artists and from the room into what do we make of that and what can people go out with? Mm. Tanya, Eric, I'm tired, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I, mean, I think what we start by making of it is that I wish that the panelists that spoke today were the ones running this country and that we were all part of their cabinet. Yes. <laughs> and I think that until we can make that real, we can tor work towards building the democracy that we've never had. Can Art Save Democracy was intentionally um, a, a falsehood because it implies that there's a democracy to be saved, but America has never been one. So when we started talking about how to bring together this group to answer this provocation, we wanted to explore how do we use art to build this democracy that we are striving towards. And I think we got some amazing ideas in this room. And it's important to have these gatherings where you bring people together to air and to commune and to feel joy and to feel emotion in each other's presence. And then what happens after you leave this room and how you take that into your communities and what you can do, I do think can help lead us towards that better democracy. So I was taking notes as much as possible um, while this was happening, but the 
you know, as storytellers, what's so powerful about this happening at Sundance is that you have some of the best storytellers in the world here. And as storytellers, you have the power to change the picture, which then has the power to change the narrative, which then has the power to change the public discourse. And when that public discourse is changed, it's hard to anticipate how much that might pivot someone in a particular way to make a particular decision, whether it be in the voting booth, in their community, in their workplace, or in their school. So I feel that that responsibility is one that artists have and that they can really help bring out there into the world. There were, um, there's been this fear, um, there's so much angst in this world, and I think also using art to alleviate that angst is so important. How do we create moments of radical joy and radical healing through art to give people some levity in their lives? And also, um, there's this fear that we're kind of sliding towards authoritarianism, and we hear so much from amazing writers like Masha Gessen and Erica Chenoweth, and so I'm going to cite some of the advice that they have given that I think are important for us all to remember, not just as artists, but also as people. And um, you know, Erica Chenoweth has outlined what are the greatest signs that we're heading towards authoritarianism. And she talks about how important it is that simple act of registering people to vote. It sounds so basic, um, but voter suppression and voter manipulation are really some of the most serious threats to our democracy right now. And we're seeing the potential for that to change radically as we move into 2020. So um, registering to people to vote is like a kind of solid takeaway. Standing up for and standing with vulnerable communities and artists, there's like a very wide swath of communities that are vulnerable under this current administration. So it's like, how do we stand up for and stand with them? And one way is through art, through highlighting these stories, to bearing witness, to making sure that we see and then also supporting a free press, like a sign that we are losing our grip on democracy and that sliding towards authoritarianism is the erosion of a free press. And one way that we can um, push back against that is by supporting it, subscribing to your favorite publications, the truth-telling publications, and really making sure that they feel supported by us because we need them to bear witness to what's going on today. So, so those are some of the takeaways that came out for me from here. Eric, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I, yes, a lot. Yes. But um, I, there's, I mean, this is a great conversation. Thank you all for participating. I mean, one, just one quick anecdote in response to what Dream was saying and, and Jane and Lisa, you know, um, I was in Puerto Rico last week, which is still very much recovering from the hurricane and the economic disaster that preceded the hurricane. Uh, and the political colonialism that currently exists in, in Puerto Rico. Um, there's a young theater troupe called E Habia No Luz, and um, they are telling incredible stories about their community, but after the hurricane, they were trying to figure out, like, what do we, what do, we do? How do, we, how do we respond to this? So they went out to rural communities and, you know, said, hey, can we volunteer? Can we, can we help you cut down trees so you can get your electricity back? And, and one village um, leader got really upset with them and said, no, don't cut our trees. We know how to cut our trees. You're artists. Tell stories, like revive our spirits. You know, that's your job. And don't tell me that art isn't a primary need. Um, and, and how those stories are told and constructed, I mean, I think it is a really exciting time where in film, in theater, in, you know, uh, art and dance and choreography and, um, you know, we, we have in science fiction, I just read The Fifth Element, which I can't wait until somebody makes a movie of it. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, like it's an exciting time when other voices are, are, are really shaping the culture in which we, in which we exist. And, and a lot of those voices are here. I mean, Rashid Johnson, who, you know, before he took over Hollywood, is now, you know, was, was, we were, he was one of the first artists that we were working with. I saw Jesse Williams, who did a billboard with us. I mean, there's all kinds of bleeding over between what we're calling art and, you know, creativity as a form of shaping the society in which we live. And hopefully, like Dream, you're saying, like, shift the basic stories that, that we're, that we're uh, premising our actions and our beliefs and our our politics and everything else upon. 
Yeah, and I would say one, one more thing on that. Um, I mean, I think what we've witnessed since the unleashing of everything that had been kind of hiding just beneath the surface with the outcome of the last election, there's been this incredibly um, exciting and also terrifying outpouring of stories and truth telling. And it's like, how do we keep up and where do we go from here? And I think that we're still figuring that out. I kind of share Lisa's pessimism that, uh, <laughs> that the solutions are elusive because as long as we have the constructs of real estate and money, there is actually no way to avoid power structures and power structures lend themselves to abuse. So it's in how do we chip away at that? And I think that's what artists can do. And I take hope, you know, it's, it's so easy to feel hopeless, but I found, um, for me, I think about, um, as with that Toni Morrison um, writing that also makes me feel so like inspired to keep going. I also think about Betty Reed Soskin, whom if you don't know her, she was introduced to me by a friend, but she's the oldest living national park ranger in America, 97 years old, and a civil rights activist. And she has lived through many, many, many periods of tumult in this country. And I was visiting her in Oakland a couple of months ago and she talks often publicly and privately about how we are in one of those periods of tumult right now when democracy is being redefined. But we all have to remember that we do have access to the reset buttons. And I think that that's where artists can step in to help people find the way to those reset buttons. Thank you so much, Tanya. And I, I just to, to finish, I wanted to, I was particularly moved by you talking about Venezuela and your experience and these conversations that we have uh, in this country and in my country in the UK about some near future state, you are living in that. And so these aren't abstract concepts. They're, that's your reality. It's the reality in Brazil, so many other places. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to leave you with a uh, Great gratitude that you came to this panel and spent time with us, and also to our featured artists who spent time thinking what they wanted to give to you, um, and to Oakwee who just moved my soul in my body as you approach the stage. Um, two quotes. The first from James Baldwin. The purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. And the second by Bertolt Brecht, which I read in the prologue to Tommy Orange's novel, There, There. Tommy Orange will be here with us on Monday at a panel. The Brecht quote is, in the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. So thank you all for coming and enjoy your day. Thank you, Tabitha.